Okay, great. And we are recording and uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our third Women's History Month event of March. My name is Regina and I'm a librarian with Lone Star College Sci Fair in Harris County Public Library. And we are thrilled to partner with the National 19th Amendment Society of Iowa for a video tour of the Carrie Lane Chapman Cat Girlhood Home and Museum. And we are honored to have the great, great nephew of Carrie Lane Chapman Cat, Mr. Timothy Lane, join us for a presentation on Cat today. Uh, please note that the audio and camera of all attendees will stay muted during the presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, please type them into the comment or Q&A box. It, you should see that at the bottom right of your screen. Um, if you have any issues typing your chat in, when we get to the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation, you can use the raise your hand function. If you hover next to your name on the participants list or the attendees list, and you can raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. So we will reserve the last 10 minutes of the program for Q&A. And if, um, again, if you prefer to ask your question out loud, just use the raise your hand function and I can unmute your mic. Um, okay, moving on. So in 2020, we celebrated the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted most women the right to vote in primary elections. Uh, Texas was the first Southern state to vote to ratify the 19th Amendment. And today we are going to learn more about famous suffragist Carrie Chapman Catt, her life in Iowa, and her role in winning women the right to vote. So Cheryl, I'm gonna go ahead and Turn the floor to you. I'm going to unmute you. And um, if you'll tell us a little bit about yourself and your connections to the uh, Cat Girlhood Home and Museum before we start the video. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Regina. It is a joy to talk about a passion, which is Carrie Chapman Cat and her Girl at Home Museum here in Charles City. A little bit about myself. I um, used to own a small business for eight years. Then I entered the world of politics and became the second woman elected as county commissioner for a neighboring county to Charles City, served in that office for eight years, then got married and moved to Charles City. And it was shortly after I moved here, I was asked to join the board and come out to Carrie's Grill at Home. And it just struck a chord with me as a recovering politician to know that I could not have had that if it had not been for Carrie's work. So with that, um, I've enjoyed my service and continue to work there. And every time I go out and every time we give a tour of Carrie's Girl at Home, I learn something new that just strikes me as amazing of everything that Carrie accomplished. Um, did you want to have Tim introduce himself now? Because that's so basically where we're at. Okay, so well, after we'll run the video and then I'll have okay. I'll present Tim and his uh do his introduction. Okay. So if you are ready for me to pull up the video, now, um, if you can try pulling that up. So if we're gonna go right into the video, then a little bit a preface for the video. Last summer, as everyone knows, everything got topped on its head. You know what you normally did in person, you either had to cancel it or find a new way to get that information presented to your guest and your audience. So what we had done normally the last, oh, five, seven years, we have a Prairie Day Camp for elementary students. And our program assistant last summer created a nice eight minute tour to walk through the museum so that everyone could have a chance to see it. And when we go into that, you will be able to have a good glimpse as to what is in the home. One of the key things that we tell visitors to Carrie's Girl at Home is that this is the same home that her dad built, and it's over 150 years old. One of the things when the board discovered the home was in disrepair in 1990, and they stepped into action, raised the money, got the home purchased, and went to the hard work of getting it restored and they restored it to the, re the levels of National Historic Registry to where it could be placed on that, which they did achieve that status as well. One of the great discussion points they had when they were restoring it was, what do you put on the inside? 
and they landed on the decision that the home was going to be the site that would be telling the body of work of Carrie. She had so much to tell, so they said, you know, we're not going to put furniture in there. They then partnered with the University of Northern Iowa students in their applied design class, and they created these amazing timelines that cover the walls in the home. And the timelines are such that the top timeline tells all about Carrie. The middle timeline talks about suffrage. Then that bottom timeline talks about global impacts. As we know, something that may be happening in the Suez Canal that will impact us and have a trickle down impact on us. So that's what that bottom timeline is. And so going through that, I will try to point out and pull out some of the highlights from there. And with that, I believe we are ready to start the video, Regina. Thank you. And just to let our attendees know that we will be pulling up the YouTube video to share. You will not hear audio um, because Cheryl will be narrating as we move through the video and she's going to let me stop at any point. Um, yes. And if you have any comments, just type them into the comment box or the Q&A box. So bear with me one moment as I pull up the video. Okay. What we see here is the porch from the front porch of Carrie's Grill at Home. And this is where visitors will normally enter. And we come in and go around. Okay. Yeah, now, keep going. There we go. Yep. The, the brick sidewalk that we're walk, looking at right here, that is one of our fundraisers that we use to help support our efforts here to maintain the Grill at Home. The bricks, um, there's over 750 bricks that are in this sidewalk currently, and we get new brick orders every year. And so can viewers today go on your website and? Yes, if they the go on the website, www.catt.org, there is a link to download a brick order form and to have your name commemorate and help with Carrie's Girl at Home. So here's the point where we say welcome to Carrie's Girl at Home. We are thrilled to have you here and joining us today. And we can enter the building now. So every brick that you see, you can let the video play out. Yeah. Every brick that you see on the girl at home, when they were restoring it, those were all taken off, mortar was scraped, and they were reapplied to the home. And that was part of the historic registry requirements. So when you walk in the room here, this can be a good stopping point. So what you see right here on the left-hand side of that picture, there are three dresses that we will, there you go, that's even better place, yep. <clears throat> right here. So if you look straight ahead above the door, there is a, an exposed lintel. That was original to the house. They discovered that when they were in the process of renovation, and when you are when you visit in person, you can actually inspect and see where there were some different um, hashtag marks made on there through the building process. Now, the three dresses that you see right in the middle, there will be a better view in a second. But those three dresses were actually worn by Carrie and Iva Dell Stevenson, who is also a relative of Carrie's, actually was um, she received these dresses and we have them on display out at Carrie's. And the question, you'll notice that all three are blue, which that tells you too, you know what Carrie's favorite color was, it was blue. And they're absolutely stunning in their detail and just they're, they're beautiful. Their design and detail is amazing. So when we walk through the doorway, 
you'll actually as, just let the video roll as you're walking through the doorway when we go there you will actually see oh there's the up close of the the lintel it's actually it's just amazing over 150 years and it's still doing its job and doing its duty that's what the home looked like with all of the bricks taken off and exposed and then here it shows that the students from town we had great community support they came out and worked countless hours to get all the bricks scraped off and get them ready to be put back up on the home So here are the dresses again. And the detail on that lace and every dress had a pocket. Carrie also, um, she had a, that was one requirement for any of the clothing that she had, they had to have a pocket in them. Now we'll go into the main room and you can see the three timelines that's showing the double brick wall structure so there are two walls that they built it has a uh, early um, insulation to keep the cold air out and the hot air out in the summer The first picture here, this is where every visitors and every tour will start. There's a picture of Carrie when she was about seven years old. And you can see the timelines where they talk about Carrie's on the top, the middle point is suffrage, and then on the bottom. So what you'll notice there is that Carrie came to Iowa with her family, Lucius Lane and Maria Lane and her older brother Charles. They moved there when she was seven, and it was in this home here when she was 13 that she first learned women could not vote. Her dad and the hired hand came in and they were getting cleaned up to go to town. Carrie asked what was the occasion and they said, well, we're going in to vote. And Carrie looked at her mom and asked, well, how come mom isn't going? And they scoffed and said the vote was too important for women. And Carrie knew then at the age of 13, she would work to get that changed. That became one of her lifelong goals. Yep. And now the video can go. <clears throat> Carrie attended Charles City Schools. And as we come to this panel up here, when she graduated Charles City, she wanted to go to college. And she worked in the library for 10 cents an hour to help pay her way through school. And she also washed dishes for nine cents an hour. And when she joined college, there were seven other women in her class, I believe. But when she graduated three and a half years later, she was the only woman who graduated in her class. After Carrie graduated, she then, you can stop right here. She then got a job teaching in Mason City. So there is the faculty of six people and they were teaching hundreds of kids. And Carrie then taught for a couple of years, then at the position of superintendent opened up and they offered it to Carrie. She, um, she took the job, but there were some people who didn't think she could quite do it because of her diminutive stature. They thought she was just too petite. She wasn't going to be able to control these masses. As you can tell, there were a lot of kids and it was kind of mayhem. Well, Carrie knew who some of those troublemakers were. So she came into school and she had crafted a two foot whip that was crafted to her hand. <laughs> and she whipped the, some of the rowdier kids into shape. Well, that, really brought a lot of sense of um, structure to the classroom, but it also created a little bit of dissent with the public who didn't quite think that was right. Well, back in that time, the way that they settled differences was to write about it in the paper. So Carrie 
proceeded to write her letter to the editor it, to get it put in the paper. And when she took it down, that was where she met Leo Chapman. Um, the story is told shortly after she did that, they had a whirlwind courtship and they got married just after a few months because Leo um, defended Carrie and he supported her mission and he also believed in suffrage as well. And so they got married. Well, then when Leo went to bat, as a good supporting spouse would do, he he came under fire. Well, they ended up selling the paper and Leo then said, we're going to go out to California. Carrie stayed here to close things up and Leo went ahead. And now if we start the video, we'll go into the parlor room, which is where Leo and Carrie got married. And you'll see a picture of what her wedding dress looked like. And there's Leo and Carrie. So Leo then got to California, contracted typhoid fever and passed away. And Carrie rushed to try to get out there before he passed away, but he that just was not to be. So here Carrie is, a young woman landing in San Francisco, and she got a job then to support herself. She worked as a reporter, one of the first female reporters in the area. It was while she was in San Francisco, though, that she connected, reconnected actually with George Catt. Uh, Carrie was walking down the street and deep in thought, and she heard someone hollering, Carrie Lane, Carrie Lane, and here it was George Catt. And they reconnected. He was also at Iowa State Ag College, and that was where they met. And he admired Carrie even back then. And um, I've also asked the question, I thought, how do you find not one but two men who support suffrage? And someone reminded me that, well, you know, Carrie would only hang around in groups where they thought the same thing, you know, supporting suffrage. So Carrie and George had a courtship and got married. One of the unique parts of their marriage was that there was an agreement that George said he made enough money in his work and he firmly believed in suffrage. He said, Carrie, you go get suffrage done two months in the spring and two months in the fall. You go work for the cause and I will work to support us. And after that, Carrie was off to the races. She immersed herself in the suffrage work and quickly rose to the attention of Susan B. Anthony because she gave a lot of speeches. So if we start the video, it will scan around after her marriage to George and she worked her way up into the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And if we stop right about there, it was in 1899. That seemed to have been a turning year for Carrie. She gave 51 speeches, attended more than that conventions, traveled by 13,000 miles in one year. And to keep in mind, that was before planes, trains, and automobiles. It was hard slogging work and probably not even a good gravel road to drive on. It was hot, dusty work, but Carrie did that in one year's time. Then, unbeknownst to her at the time, she was going to enter a period of three to five years where she suffered some immense losses. The first loss would be her dad passed away. And then a few years later, her, hus her second husband, George, passed away. And then a few years after George passing, she lost her mom and her younger brother. And that, to me, I cannot imagine the deep sense of sadness she must have had. And the doctor told her, you need some time, Kira. You need to take a break and you need to just take care of yourself. Well, Carrie's idea of taking a break was to travel the world. So she embarked on this worldwide tour and everywhere she went, she talked suffrage and she talked to women all over in Africa, in India. She met Mahatma Gandhi and Everywhere she had audiences with people who can make an impact, and but she always spoke about suffrage. 
So when she came back to the United States then in about 1915, she was once again, you know, tapped on the shoulder to come back into the, the organizations in the United States for suffrage. And in 1916, they said, we need you to lead us and to get us going. So um, the other question that's been asked frequently is, so who was guiding NASA when Carrie took out, you know, when she had that break? And it was Anna B. Shaw who stepped up and helped lead NASA while Carrie was gone on her worldwide tour. Well, when Carrie came back in 1916, she told them, here's the deal, people. I will come back, but we're going to follow my plan. Because prior to that, there had been a patchwork quilt of suffrage and abilities for women to vote. Some could vote in cities, some could vote in cities and states. They couldn't vote in national. It was just all over the board how women can vote. And Carrie said, if we have, if we want to do this, we have to make sure the right to vote is for all women at all levels in all elections, period. And the way we need to do that is we need to push for a national amendment. And so that took a two prong approach. They needed to get Congress to pass it. Then they needed to get each state. They needed to get that perfect 36 states to ratify it. And then it would become the law of the land. So that's what they did. But also remember in 1916 was when we were entering World War I. Carrie was such a keen strategist. She knew that in order to get all of these men to support it, she had to also support their cause. And their cause was that we would be engaged in World War I. And that caused a great hardship for Carrie. She believed that war was not the answer. She believed in world peace as well. But her greater vision at that time was she had to get suffrage passed. So she asked her fellow suffragists to please step down, step back from suffrage. We need to help support our men and our troops in the war. That caused Carrie to have a lot of hardship with her peace, um, her other peace allies as well. And they actually disowned her there for a while. So if we can continue moving on. So Carrie came in and said, 1917, 1918 is like, this is what we're doing. And they got Congress to pass that 19th Amendment in Congress. Then Kerry started the battle of state by state by state. They worked and it, you know, some states were easier than others. And I believe there will be a map that will come up and you'll see pretty quickly. Um, as Regina had said earlier, Texas was, I believe the first one to actually ratify the 19th Amendment which I'm kind of jealous being from Iowa that I wish they would have, that Iowa was the 10th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, July 2nd of 1919. So there's the map. The states that are in white did not ratify. The states that are in green, we were the first 10 to do it. And then they just started falling like dominoes. Everything to the West got her done. It came down to Tennessee. And Tennessee was where that hard battle was in it. It passed by one vote, uh, which is actually even more important to think about the true value of your vote. One vote can make a huge difference. The dress here in the corner is a dress that we have. Um, the daughter of one of our board members was taking a costuming design master's class, and she then recreated one of Carrie's dresses, and Carrie actually had one, I believe it was this one, she actually called it her victory dress. So she had this dress specially made so that when each state, when they would pass it and get it ratified and she could see, you know, check one off, check one off, she got this dress on and she celebrated just to show how special it was, okay? And those, those are just women that it shows, you know, they lined up and they voted. So now the next room that we're gonna go into, when we go to our right here, the, the camera will span, scan, 
this room is what I refer to as um, the League of Women Voters and Carrie's other devotion, her work to world peace. So keep in mind the League of Women Voters, Carrie formed that in February of 1920, a full six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified. Again, such a strategist, she could see that there were going to be times where women would need assistance in knowing how do you evaluate that ballot and how do you make sure you access that ballot box and to recognize the importance of getting that ballot and voting. So she formed that League of Women Voters just specifically for that purpose. She knew that there would be issues in some places and in some states for women to get that ballot. Then over on this wall here, this talks about Carrie and George both still had a fondness in their heart for Iowa State University. And George was actually a leader of an Iowa State alum group in Chicago and nationwide to help support their alma mater. And Carrie also supported that as well. Right here on the right, you can see the image of Carrie up here. This talks about her international travels and International Women's Suffrage Alliance and her world travel from 1911 to 1912. The pictures that are on the wall, those are some of the pictures. If you recall the three dresses we saw early on, these pictures were in that trunk as well. So they actually were ones that Carrie took or had captured. They're just amazing. So I guess I would end it by saying, you need to come and visit to actually get up close and personal with all of those. And this is probably Carrie's most famous quote, to the wrongs that need resistance, to the rights that need assistance, to the future in the distance, give yourselves. Um, and I think with that, I can kind of end. I, I, I feel like I've talked enough. Thank you, Regina. Great, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was fabulous. So I just have a, a question um, where, if if we're going to come up and visit the Cat Museum, where would you recommend people book their stay? Oh, that is a good question. It depends if they're driving or flying. Um, if they are coming up, we have a hotel here. We also have, it's not like a VRBO, but they have like cabins that are really nice just out on the edge of town here that's close. Then we have a couple of hotels that are here close by. Um, I know that if you go on our site, cat.org, there's a link that would say, talk about um, what to see, do, and how to say, see here, other things to see and do here. And that would have it as well. If they're flying in, we have a local airport in Cedar Rapids and in Waterloo, there's an airport. Then the major hubs are up, up in Minneapolis and down in Des Moines. And those are about a two, two and a half hour drive from here. But we have plenty of places to stay. That would be nice. Um, you can come and visit anytime. Our regular season where we are open seven days a week is Memorial Day to Labor Day. And, uh, but if you come up throughout the rest of the year, we welcome you to come and visit. You just need to call ahead for an appointment. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, yeah. and, and the follow up email will share some of that information that you that you just gave us. Yeah. So now I'm going to unmute Mr. Timothy Lane. I'm going to pull you up here. Tim. OK, so Tim, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. You're here. OK, so um, now we're going to go give the floor to Tim and Tim, we are excited to have you join us today in celebration of Women's History Month and of your great great aunt Carrie. Please tell us a little about yourself before I pull up the presentation slides. That'll be uh, by the way, I'm as excited to be here as you might be as excited to have me. I grew up 
as uh, Cheryl mentioned just recently, uh, one of the uh, nearby towns to Charles City is Waterloo. And my father moved from Charles City uh, to Waterloo uh, for you know business opportunities, et cetera. Um, and growing up in Waterloo, I was just cruising along as a, a, a youngster without much uh, ability to pay attention to anything. And I discovered that my city was the home of the Sullivan brothers. And that just lit a fire under me. And I was studying all things history and I was excited about history because it was local and kind of meant something to me. And at that point, my family said, well, you know, if you're interested in history, you know, your great, great aunt was, you know, uh, very significant um, in, in a lot of history books for in, in suffrage. And at the time, of course, I didn't know what suffrage, you know, meant. Uh, but I started at the age of, at the, she started getting involved in this. I started getting involved in the carry Kane Chapman histori historical process and uh, have been reading and, and picking up a, a Looks like we are having eventually some ended up in the Iowa Department of Public Health, worked there for 30 there years go. and retired and, the, and kind of devoted myself to a lot of for an effort. Hi, Tim. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties with your screen. If you're able to Turn off your camera or pause your camera. That'll help us get you back in there. I want to thank our attendees for your patience. As you know, this is the nature of doing virtual programming. Sometimes you have bandwidth issues. Cheryl is kindly giving Tim a ring on his cell to let him know to pause his camera so that maybe we can continue with his. That's what I'm doing. Perfect. Cheryl, it looks like Tim backed out and he's maybe going to re-enter or if you have him here on speaker, if he'd like to get him sharing. Okay. Thank you for your patience. We should be back up and running in a moment. And Cheryl, this is a good time to ask you this question. Yes. So this past, this past year, did the museum close to visitors due to COVID or did, did they allow a limited amount of people to come in and visit? Good question. Well, we did. It, it just took us, caught us off guard so much. It was not anything we had prepared for. So initially we did, we just closed down completely. We didn't let anyone in. Just because it took time for us to walk through that protocol on what do we need to do to keep our visitors safe, to keep our docents safe. We did open up the middle of June and it was by appointment only. We limited it to just three days in the week and they limited the group size to nine people. And through the summer, we came to realize we, we got our stride down and we were able to figure out how to do that. And um, so we're kind of easing that a bit now. We still are asking when people come to visit, we have hand sanitizers by multiple doors and everything there that you could possibly touch. We also ask that they wear a mask. If they are not feeling well, we request that they please come and visit a different time. 
but uh, our site is open year round because there's a beautiful restored prairie on the site. There is a 19 tree apple orchard with heritage varieties that here in Iowa in about another month, it will absolutely be stunning to see 19 apple trees with the beautiful and fragrant blossoms on there. Um, I would encourage you to come about any time. Last fall, always Labor Day weekend, we host a family apple picking day free to the public. And they come out and it was a perfect social distancing event to where they could come and I mean, Bags, bags and bags of apples were taken. Like the comment we had was that the apple trees did not get the memo that there was a pandemic going on. So it's like they were so abundant with fruit for everyone to come and take. And, and watching the kids that day, they would go and they were running through our prairie because we have a nice walkway that we mow and maintain to help highlight some of the specific flowers like the compass tree or the compass plant and some of the, I'm at a loss for the names right now, but it's absolutely very beautiful. And it was just fun to see the kids cut loose and see families sitting, you know, at the picnic tables, we had space six feet apart for social distancing, but it was a lot of fun that day. So yes, they can come anytime, but back to the pandemic, we're probably still going to ask that people, you know, kind of maintain the distance, wear your mask and come on. And it looks like maybe Tim is back. Well, yes, we have Tim back as a panelist. Tim, are you able to hear us? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Thank you so much for, for your patience and joining us again. And we are ready to pick up where you left off. Well, I'm not exactly sure where we left off, uh, other than I'm excited to be here. Um, I grew up close to Charles City. Um, at the age that Carrie started getting involved in the suffrage movement, I started getting involved in history, excited about history, and even got a degree from the University of Northern Iowa um, in history. And even though I worked in public health, I always would include history messages in my uh, public health lectures when I would either deal with the public, et cetera. Um, and when it boils down to it, um, I, I'm, I try to remain objective, uh, but at the same time, I feel that, you know, Carrie Lane, Chapman Cat, is one of the most phenomenal uh, individuals uh, in the history of the United States. Um, and uh, when George Washington uh, was successful in the revolution uh, and the American Revolution, after his uh, hard fought victories over a very short period of time, uh, 69 men were able to vote. Um, and Carrie, starting in 1872 to 1920, after her decades of struggle, millions of women uh, won the right to vote. And as Elaine Weiss in her great book, The Woman's Hour said, it's one of the most amazing, uh, greatest civil rights victories uh, in the history of, of America. Uh, so, and yet, uh, like so many women's stories, uh, it just doesn't seem to get, you know, there's a reason we, it's his story and not her story you know, that we, we study in our uh, grade schools and in our colleges. The um, we can, uh, I'd uh, like to, you know, just share uh, a, perhaps a, a couple quotes. You know, one of the things that I always enjoyed, and, and Cheryl touched on this, is that Carrie would travel and her, her first kind of field operation assignment, you know, the first was South Dakota, which was kind of a learning experience. Her second in 1893 was Colorado, where she traveled to. 29 counties um, and it was the first time that uh, the women in America won the right to vote uh, by a state election initiative. Every prior to that there was executive orders which of course can be rescinded and in some states were. Um, and of the 29 states that Kerry visited, 26 went for suffrage. Um, and it's like in news of the nation, when you go back, the, the only way you can kind of capture, you know, we don't have uh, newsreels 
uh, of that time, but we can read the, the paper reports. And it's just crystal clear uh, that she was one of the greatest speakers of that era. And, and in fact, some of her speeches have been cited as one of some of the greatest speeches of American history, whether they be addresses to the Congress of the United States or uh, to some uh, Buena Vista uh, town, uh, a town in Colorado in, in 1893. Um, Mrs. Philip Snowden of Great Britain, known as a brilliant speaker, was asked who the best leader of the suffrage movement was. She was emphatic. I will go further, I will go further, measured by the grasp and power of her mind and her wisdom, her self-control and her concentration to a great cause, by her power to plan, her capacity to execute, and her genius for leadership, by her unsurpassed eloquence in speech, and her absolutely unselfish devotion to the cause of women, I hold Carrie Chapman Catt, the first and greatest woman of the English-speaking race. Uh, and that was from a, a high-ranking British uh, suffrage leader that uh, uh, you know kind of indicated just how well-respected Kerry was not only in the United States but around the world. And that was you know the other thing uh, that I think was is is just absolutely remarkable about it. She would get off a train in India and by at noon and by the that evening have a suffrage club. Uh, established. The same would go in, in Africa, in China, in Japan. Um, and there were suffragists in Brazil that referred to her as their mother. Uh, she referred to the women of the Philippines as her, their, her sister. And it was just the re remarkable, the impact she had. And if you could, I'd like you to, can you advance, Regina, the slides there? Yes, I will advance the slides on your queue. Uh, go ahead. I see we've got uh, 12 minutes left. Go ahead again. And uh, the mission of the National 19th Amendment Society is to preserve Carrie's legacy and share her story with those who visit and tour the home, which Cheryl kind of uh, has well documented. Uh, I'd like you to go on again. Um, I happen to also be a cyclist uh, and my big idea for co the year of COVID was to design a bike jersey, which Susan B. Anthony thought bicycles were like the greatest thing ever for, for women. And there's a quote on the back of that jersey about that. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to have sales uh, to, to bike rides in Iowa, which is, by the way, um, uh, <laughs> We had a special day on RAGBRAI, which is the world's greatest bike tour uh, designed for celebrating women's vote. And that kind of, uh, you know, came to a, a, a stop during the, the year of COVID. And let's go to the next slide. And so we decided this year uh, to have a victory lap. Uh, there below, uh, and you can uh, catch up with these on our website, the things that will be, uh, be occurring uh, if, if for some reason anybody wants to uh, make a trip to Iowa. Uh, Field of Dreams is not that far away from Charles City. Uh, you can stop in Waterloo and, and stay there. There's some great attractions there. The As everybody knows, uh, the largest uh, tractor plant in the world was located in, in Waterloo. In fact, the tractor was invented there. Um, and we can go to the next slide now. Like I said, those things are available at the website. Time and time and time and time again, reporters would refer to my great, great aunt and her stature. Uh, she might have been petite next to men, but she was tall uh, for women. And she had a magnetic presence on the stage. And she gave speeches a hundred times. And every time she gave a speech, her delivery and her resonance and her passion became greater and greater and greater. And like I said, the news reporters of the day would just, it was like they were just fawning, her reviews were just off the chart, just amazing. But I always liked the, the there's a great number of photos of my great, great aunt when she was 70 and 80. I like the ones when she was young and when she was saying like, Babe Ruth calling her shot. I'm going to do something about this. I am going to, we're going to get this done and this is how it's going to happen. I'd like to go to the next slide now. 
Um, given that we're in a library, sort of virtually, um, I wanted to talk, you know, touch on the fact that she loved books and this is her book plate. Now, one of the things I inherited, my family did, and then it was handed down to me, are a lot of her books. Uh, so I just thought I'd throw in a, a book plate. And by the way, while we're talking about books, let me also recommend, in addition to Lynn Weiss's uh, The Woman's Hour, uh, The Hello Girls by Elizabeth Cobb and Radium Girls by Kate Moore, which were, you know, of the era, and I think really give you some uh, related information to the, the value that women had in getting uh, the vote. And the next slide, please. Ah, now, this is my Texas connection. You'll notice uh, that in 1942, the comics included uh, Carrie. Uh, they had a series, Wonder Woman comics had a series, uh, and each issue of Wonder Woman featured a Wonder Woman of history, and Carrie was one of those Wonder Women. Uh, and here you see her uh, visiting Texas uh, in the comic book. Uh, and the women uh, of the United States kind of, you know, holding up their hands in, in praise to her. Now, I want to, there's at least one of, there's two stories that I'm going to touch on right now. When she was a child growing up in school in Charles City, every spring the boys would trap snakes with the toe of their, their boots and grab them and chase girls around uh, the schoolyard. Well, my great, great aunt, saw him do this and the next day she would trap a snake grab it behind the head and she'd say well if the boys can do it i can do it and if girls are scared we'll find out what the boys think about this and the next day after seeing this happen she was chasing the boys around the schoolyard with a snake in her hand and they fled uh the other one was again you know she, she had corporal punishment uh, in the Mason City Schools, but she also went up to a, a boy who was taunting a girl who'd lost her hoop of her skirt and was mortified, you know, by that and just hauled off and gave him a big slap across the face. Um, and uh, the, those stories were retelled uh, in the Wonder Woman comic books. Next slide, please. But as it, it, it was indicative of how even at an early age, she had this sense of what's good for the goose is good for the gander and just would not put up for with anything. In college, she wouldn't put up with the fact that there was a literary society that wouldn't let women debate. And by the next year, she was running the debates for the literary society and the men seemed to go, oh, they, they accepted it. She not only did it with you know force, but she also did it with grace and they kind of accept the, the logic of, of her arguments. You know, she worked her way in, um, but she did it without alienating those individuals. Next slide, please. Um, and that led, that, that literary society at Iowa State Agricultural College led to her addressing, you know, the Congress of the United States and the leaders of Europe, you know, and, and, and as I said, constantly getting better and better at writing and delivering those speeches. Next slide. Um, I, I put in this slide from the comics because that in Elaine Weiss's book, uh, The Women's Hour, we were in the NCAA tournament and we see these individuals winning football games or winning basketball games and they, they they've had this pent up work that they've done over a year and the joy that they have and they're they're spraying their coaches with bottles of water or Gatorade. Imagine what the emotions were with Carrie and, the, and Elaine Weiss does a great job of capturing it when she returned to New York and the mayor was there and the governor was there and the uh, the army had a you know, the police had a mounted patrol with her and there was an army band and there was confetti and there was a bouquet the size of a Volkswagen that they gave her you know, with the uh, card saying from the enfranchised women of America we give you thanks after that decades of work on that compared to you know the work that you know athletes put in for you know a season next slide please wait a minute What's Sarah Fuller doing here? Well, um, 
I have good reason for including Sarah Fuller. She kicked that extra point for Vanderbilt 100 years after Kerry had won the right for women to vote. And my point is that suffrage was not only universal in, in dealing with the vote, it was universal in dealing with what the votes were about, down to Title IX. One year before we got the 19th Amendment, legislators started thinking about this and, and they passed prohibition, which was a big women's issue, in uh, the 18th Amendment, which was a disastrous amendment, let's you know, let's be frank on that, uh, was passed. Uh, and but the year after the Shepherd Towner Act was passed, and I would make the argument that every year since there has been legislation that has been significant and related to the fact that women have the right to vote. I see that we're at 156. Let's quickly go to the next slide. By the way. Sarah's helmet has a rendition of the skyline from Nashville a hundred years ago. Um, and the one in the middle is the state capital where that vote uh, occurred that gave women the right to vote. And her helmet also didn't say Vanderbilt at the bottom. It said play like a girl. Next slide. And we've heard this before to the wrongs that need resistance, to the right that needs assistance, to the future and the distance, give yourselves. Carrie Chapman Cat. And with that, Regina, um, I wanna end my part of the presentation um, and leave at least some time, or if not some time, uh, some addresses uh, that individuals uh, that have questions uh, can, can ship them off to. Great, yes. Thank you so much, Tim. And I'm I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I'd like to see if you're able to turn your camera back on. I think I can now. It's I didn't have this, uh, you know, when at the start of this. So there we go. We're Although to... I, I'm sure that this doesn't add much to the video quality of this presentation. Great. No, we'd love to see you. And um, we do have quite a few questions, and we'll get to what we can. I think you answered a lot of the questions that were emailed to me. So let me see. And if we already answered this, uh, feel free to to remind me about that. But uh, let's see. And looking in our, our Q&A box, if, if anyone in the audience has a question, please go ahead and type that into the chat. Or if you have any comments, please go ahead and type that in the chat. Uh, we tried to highlight the questions that were already answered, but one of the questions, and this is for Tim or Cheryl, uh, did Kat always have the goal of world peace or did her goal develop over time after she was involved in the American women's suffrage movement? And Cheryl, let me unmute you. I was gonna say, I would let Tim defer to that. The first mention where I know they talk about world peace Oh gosh, it was after Carrie had gotten in, engaged with suffrage, but the first true highlight, as I mentioned, was in 1916 when she asked the suffragists to step back and support the troops when her other friends who were in World Peace basically disowned her and said, nope, you cannot give it up. You have to serve both. And Carrie did, but Tim may know more research on that. I, I just her, think she's had it for a long time. Her very first argument for suffrage was a 13 year old uh, boy who was actually interested in dating her. And he said, well, women can't vote because they, they don't serve in the military. And uh, she said, well, wait a minute, there's a bunch of folks around here that weren't in the military that were male and, and are voting. So from the very first you know, uh, months of her suffrage work, she realized that women, uh, uh, this was a touchy issue, but as she became a world traveler, as she became aware of the plight of women in South Africa and India and China and Japan and the Philippines, uh, the, the, the concept of war continued and grew and grew and grew and grew, but there wasn't an epiphany moment like there was for women voting.
Regina, are we going to be able to continue here, or um, is oh, this going to sorry. cut off exactly at uh, at two o'clock here? We still have more questions, and we can keep on going till I end the presentation. So Excellent. I, I, I just remembered it. to unmute myself. So the next question is: uh, You mentioned Elaine Weiss's, Weiss's book, The Woman's Hour, multiple times. And we did feature that for our Suffrage Centennial Book Club last year. Uh, it was a fantastic book. Um, and we learned a lot about Carrie it, from that book. So our question is, did Elaine contact you? Did she interview you or ask you any questions uh, while she was researching and writing the book? For me, no. Uh, but ever since the book was written, we've had numerous uh, uh, opportunities to to meet. She's been here uh, for the anniversary of the League of Women Voters. She's uh, been to the girlhood home. Uh, and uh, we recently, Cheryl and I, delivered the, the children's version of the Women's Hour to several libraries in, in Northeast Iowa uh, as part of the outreach, you know, program uh, for the museum. Oh, that's fantastic. So where can we find the children's version? Is that on for sale on the museum's website or uh, do the publisher website? We do have some copies available at the museum. Send an email and we can get them to you. But yes, they are also available, I believe, on Amazon.com. And it's actually called um, Oh, the Young Readers edition of the Women's Hour. So if you Google Elaine Weiss and the Women's Hour, there should be a Young Readers version coming up with that. Perfect. It's a good book. So I guess another question, uh, hearkening back to when Kat was alive and living in Iowa, what was Iowa like for women during her life, during her lifetime there? Was it oppressive or was it more progressive than other states? I'm well, going to say it depended upon where you were, but I'm going to defer that to Tim. It it also depended on who you married. Um, suffrage was a was a great addition for women whose husbands shared the decision making process and the profits and you know you know everything that went along with it. But if they if you were in an abusive relationship, not having any recourse, be it, be it you know at the local level, other than voting in the you know the school board election or something along those lines, you know it was just intolerable. It, the um, and again, uh, the the fact that the Maternal and Child Health Act was passed after you know women got the right to vote indicated well we weren't going to pay attention to women's issues until women got the right to vote. But women that had the good fortune to have good husbands, you know, you know like George Cat, who provided and who's basically he had his business taking took him on international trips that planted the seed for Carrie on her, you know, kind of becoming uh, familiar with the news of the world. Great. Okay. And uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, the last question is, uh, do you know anything about the the dynamic between Kat and Alice Paul. Um, did Kat support the Equal Rights Amendment after suffrage was passed? Did she work with Alice Paul after the amendment was passed? Cheryl, I've I've got something to say for that, but I don't want to, you know, uh, take all the all the stage here. So I, I just want to circle back really quick to the question prior asking about what it was like for women in Iowa when Carrie was growing up. One of the interesting parts that we discovered here when we were doing research for our events to plan for the 100th anniversary was that women actually had an impact on society, but it was mainly through the federation groups. There were hundreds of women's federation groups that were social group they were able to get together, and to Tim's point, it depended upon where they were, but they were across the country, and that was one of the networks that Carrie tapped into to help get that word spread for suffrage. Now, circling back to Alice Paul, we I've not really seen anything directly to that at the museum, but based on other things I have read or watched, 
they, there was a tension because Carrie did not believe in militant behavior. And they, you know, Alice Paul, she tore herself away. But we also believe, I believe anyway, they needed both of them to actually make the work happen and to get everything to kind of gel together. I believe that after suffrage passed, they they formed just a mutual, you know, respect for each other for what they had done to get the 19th Amendment passed. Tim. And Carrie left the, uh, came out of the 1920 election with tremendous amounts of funds and a tremendous, uh, you know, kind of national organization. And the, the bulk of the accolades uh, associated with that, obviously, uh, they complemented each other and they contrib both contributed, you know, kind of the one pushing and one pulling. I won't des decide who's who's who in that analogy, uh, but on on the aftermath, it was Carrie that was on the, the cover of Time magazine. It was Carrie that was indicated that might be, you know, a possible candidate for president. It was Carrie that was doing the commencement speeches across the country. It was Carrie that did the first, not only first received the first honorary degree from the University of Wyoming. It was not just for women. It was the first for both genders. Um, and uh, she had the financial wherewithal and the kind of the, the public awareness uh, that Alice just kind of uh, became active in, in other women's issues, as did, you know, Carrie. Uh, but Carrie's was on an international scale and was soon off to Europe lecturing in person Mussolini on how he needs to toe the line and uh, and on this very day in 1933 uh, Kerry received a medal uh, from the National Hebrew Association uh, because in 33 she was a, a, making folks aware of the threat that Hitler was uh, to you know the peace of the world so you can go through and find almost every day of the year there is some amazing achievement or award or recognition from Kerry, and today's March twenty uh, seventh was uh, the award uh, that was presented to her by Eleanor Roosevelt, and she received congratulatory notes from Albert Einstein, Herbert Hoover, uh, FDR, and and other you know uh, individuals. I mean, so she stayed. Uh, in the limelight um, uh, and it had a shelf life, shall we say. Right, right. Well, um, since we are running a little bit over time here due to technical difficulties, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give a last call if anyone has any comments or questions to pop them in the chat box. Um, if not, uh, I wanna thank everyone for hanging around and sticking it out through these technical difficulties that are you know, we've all come to, uh, to, to, we've grown accustomed to these technical issues over the past <laughs> year. So thanks for sticking it out. And Tim, thanks for, for joining us again. Uh, Cheryl and Tim, I wanna thank you both for joining us today and for your time and for teaching us more about the remarkable suffragist, uh, peace activist and leader uh, who is Carrie Lane Chapman Cat. I know I learned something new today, quite a few new things about her that I didn't previously know. Um, and uh, I want to remind everyone that you will be receiving a follow-up email with the books and the links that were mentioned in today's presentation. And you will also receive a link to a brief survey. And we, we really depend on that information and feedback from our participants to uh, plan future programming. So please take a few minutes to take a look at that. Again, you'll receive the email later this afternoon. And Cheryl and Tim, do you have any last comments? I, I will just say thank you. Thank you, thank you, Regina, and everyone in Texas and who's joining us here today. It's been a wonderful afternoon with you. And Tim, thank you. Um, Tim always adds that they're just fascinating insights into Carrie. And, and I wanna thank them uh, for sticking through and if there's any way that I can uh, be of any assistance to the the good folks of Texas, uh, be it Cyprus or Houston, um, you know I would be more than willing to do so. It was uh, 
it's always a, an honor. And, uh, you know, I got to give kudos to Texas. They were the ninth state to ratify uh, the 19th Amendment and beating out Iowa uh, by one position. We were the 10th. Right. Well, thank you for that con congratulatory remark. And yes, uh, uh, Tim, we are happy to have you, Cheryl. We are so happy to have you. I hope to, to see you in person when I visit the Cat Museum. And I just want to remind everyone, the Houston Chronicle did a fabulous interview with Tim um, about prior to his presentation today. And I will include that link in the follow-up email. So have a look at that. Um, everyone, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Uh, continue to celebrate Women's History Month. Take a look at our events on the library's website and maybe pick up a copy of uh, The Woman's Hour. Reserve your copy at the library, purchase a copy, and read more about Carrie Chapman Cat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.